Perfect. Yep. Perfect. I'll uh, start with that. Oh, here we go. Hang on a sec. There we go. So I have uh, no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. Uh, some of you know that I briefly worked for um, Novo Nordisk, uh, running their Type 2 Diabetes Research Institute in Oxford. Uh, and I've done some minor consulting and worked with a local small farmer on a totally unrelated project. Um, and it's not a real financial conflict, but I also helped start the Institute for Personalized Therapeutic Nutrition, which is a nonprofit uh, that seeks to translate some of this work I'll talk about today. So getting right into it, and I will go a little bit quickly through the beginning part of this talk because a lot of it's published and I wanna save some time for some unpublished data, uh, which I'll discuss at the end of the talk. So, um, you know, we all know that there is an enormous number of people that have type two diabetes. Today's therapies for type two diabetes treat the symptoms of type 2 diabetes um, uh, by sort of alleviating the uh, work that the beta cell has to do or basically replacing it with exogenous insulin or uh, bypassing its requirement uh, altogether with uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, et cetera. But none of these um, treatments that we have today have been shown to change the course, the natural history of the disease itself. And there's Emerging evidence, which I, I might get to at the end of the talk, uh, uh, for the possibility of remission of type 2 diabetes with diet and bariatric surgery, but there are no drugs that we have out here that are disease modifying. If we could get to this more, this larger uh, pre diabetes population, roughly tw twice the size of the diabetes population, per perhaps we could protect the beta cells uh, as they're on their decline here. Um, and before a significant hyperglycemia sets in. A lot of my lab is interested in uh, regeneration and survival of beta cells, but actually today I won't talk about that work at all. Uh, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions offline or, um, or on Twitter. Um, even earlier in the course of the disease, and there are uh, probably 2 billion people on earth that are overweight or, or live with obesity, is a very complex time where you don't have hyperglycemia yet, but you have insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia and adiposity. And if we could intervene at this early stage, uh, potentially we could flatten these curves, if you will, and, um, and have an impact that could be disease modifying. The problem with this early phase is so many things are increased at once, it's actually quite difficult to determine what's cause and effect. Um, a lot of your textbooks will tell you that um, insulin resistance and obesity are primary um, and that hyperinsulinemia is a, a, a reactive consequence to the insulin resistance. Uh, I actually do believe this is possible. I know we know you can get hyperinsulinemia uh, with drug induced insulin resistance and indeed with genetic insulin resistance, such as uh, folks who live with Donahue syndrome. Uh, insulin receptor mutations. But I want to talk today about whether or not it's also possible that the hyperinsulinemia in some cases, cases could drive the obesity and insulin resistance. Because the order in this causality has a big um, uh, major implications for how you uh, try to treat the disease early on. <clears throat> so the talk today will ask the question, is hyperinsulinemia, uh, can it be causal? I'm not saying it's always causal, but it, are there conditions where it can be causal? So I'll start off with the human data and then move to our mouse models where we can address causality directly. Uh, and, I, and I will also start off by saying that almost none of what I'll talk about today are my own ideas. Um, we're truly building on the, uh, uh, the shoulders of giants. And, uh, and so I'm recycling a fair number of ideas here. Some of these ideas haven't caught on, I think, as much as they should, but I'm thinking about uh, Barbara Corky, who in her Banting lecture almost a decade ago asked hyperinsulinemia, cause or consequence. Uh, Walter Fores, who uh, said diabetes, have we got it all wrong? And there's a, a number of uh, researchers who have advanced the importance of understanding hyperinsulinemia and its causality. So what would it take for it to be causal? One thing is you'd have to see it before any of the other things. And there are th these types of studies are correlative. So they have 
that issue. And I always have problems with correlative studies uh, because it really depends on how accurately you can measure all of your different um, outcomes. But this is a quite a powerful study. These are um, uh, hyperinsulinemic uh, clamps on over a thousand individuals, uh, this TRICO paper and JCI, and a third of them um, had hyperinsulinemia uh, that was in the absence of any insulin resistance. Uh, it also uh, is correlative and predictive, and this is work, again, by a, a true uh, visionary in the field, Jesse Roth, who uh, studied a long-term cohort and found that out of all the features that they examined, it was hyperinsulinemia that was the most predictive of which people would go on to, um, to get type 2 diabetes. I think there's other cohorts where it's seen in other directions, but uh, this is an example of what can happen. Similarly, and I guess this shows that I'm not, uh, I don't have a massive pharma conflict of interest, but I think it's well known now that in all of the major trials of long acting insulin, uh, you do get, uh, for example, weight gain. And there's some interesting work now coming out of Vanderbilt uh, showing even in the context of type one diabetes, that if you match for the glycemia, for example, of, of patients with Modi, that the exogenous insulin itself uh, can drive some insulin <clears throat> resistance systemically. But the, the true uh, test is whether something is necessary and that requires a loss of function experiment. And this has been done in humans. Uh, it's been done quite a few times. Here, here are some examples. One of the original examples is uh, from Elesmide who um, used disoxide, which among a few things can directly inhibit insulin secretion from the beta cells, and they saw um, uh, weight loss in these hyperinsulinemic adults, uh, concurrent with what they saw in mice. Now, there are some doses and some studies where they don't see effects, but this has also been repeated more recently uh, by Loves et al. I think this paper is only a couple of years old. But disoxide can have direct effects uh, probably in the hypothalamus as well and can have uh, effects that might be dissociated from its insulin effect. So, so what about um, insulin itself? Uh, could we reduce insulin uh, specifically? And that is uh, an idea we had now about more than a decade ago, and it led to, to most of the studies I'll talk about today. So the concept in these experiments, and some of you have heard me uh, go over this before, but um, uh, so I'll go over it a little bit quickly. Uh, the concept here is to play with the insulin gene dosage, is to control the amount of insulin that can be produced by the beta cells. And it turns out, so mice and rats are somewhat unique. Uh, you have four alleles of insulin to play with, two from insulin one and two from insulin two. In this first set of experiments, and the results are roughly similar, uh, regardless of which ones you study. This first uh, set of experiments, we've eliminated insulin two entirely to prevent compensation. And we are comparing mice that either have one allele or two alleles of insulin one. Um, so our control mice here have the normal complement of insulin one. And you can see on the um, uh, control diet here, they uh, gradually have slightly increased insulin with age. On the high fat diet, here they become uh, massively hyperinsulinemic. Um, and mice with reduced insulin gene dosage uh, in the control diet at one year out, the mice with half the insulin gene dosage have half the circulating insulin. And it's even more pronounced when we look at the high fat diet, uh, although they try to sort of mount an insulin hyperinsulinemic response. By the time you're at one year of age, it's a, it's, the insulin effect is as if they were not even fed this diet. And what's truly remarkable is that the mice can actually be reasonably happy physiologically with just one allele of insulin one. And insulin one is the minor insulin. It, there's actually less insulin one uh, made than insulin two. It's about 40% of the, the total. Aside from um, a time uh, relatively early in life uh, when they're sort of teenage mice and they're growing rapidly where you have uh, glucose intolerance, and this is exacerbated in, in uh, SPF facilities, actually, you'll have more mice die in this phase. But these mice in this old conventional facility, the vast majority of them made it through this phase and had basically normal glucose tolerance. Um, 
What this means, uh, and this is interest, an important thing here, is that I'll define hyperinsulinemia for this purpose of this talk as the insulin levels that are in excess of those that are required to sustain glucose homeostasis. So when it comes to glucose, this is truly extra insulin that I'm reducing, uh, at least throughout most of their life. And this fits with what we know about the hormone, um, the, uh, the enzymes and the signaling pathways that control lipid homeostasis we know they actually respond to much smaller amounts of insulin than, for example, GLUT4 trafficking does. And the bottom line of this uh, first bit of research is that mice that were genetically incapable of hyperinsulinemia, and this is in the absence of changes in glycemia, were genetically incapable of diet-induced weight gain. <clears throat> and the mechanism here is almost entirely a reduction in um, fat mass and fat pads and the other organs are basically uh, similar size. You can see that instead of having um, uh, swollen adipocytes, they go back to being normal. Uh, the energy expenditure here is uh, slightly increased and this is prior to weight differences and in the absence of any um, obvious changes in food intake. This is was very controversial at the time until some people that are more famous than me uh, also got into understanding uh, this, but we actually uh, purchased a we were relatively poor Canadian lab, so we had to reuse our reagents. So we got one TACMAN mini array um, that we were going to use for all the different tissues, including brown adipose tissue. And it was to our great surprise that in the white adipose tissue, we saw an upregulation, quite a strong upregulation in UCP1, uh, PGC1 alpha, PPAR gamma, PPAR alpha. And obviously we now recognize this as the program for the browning of white adipose tissue. And we showed this also at the protein level as well. Um, uh, the initial bit of work was the work of a, of a talented graduate student, Aria Marin, who's now actually uh, working for a pharma company. And um, it was followed up and I'll show you a lot of work from a, really talented um, graduate student and now independent professor, uh, Nicole Templeman. Um, but she also later on noticed that there was more total amount of brown adipose tissue in these mice with reduced insulin. More recently, a visiting fellow, uh, Diego Botticelli from uh, Brazil, uh, looked at the fat pads at the much younger mice and saw an upregulation of oxfos. Um, enzymes in these. So there's a few things going on that could contribute to increased energy expenditure. Regardless of that, um, in, the, in the mice that uh, have reduced insulin gene dosage and less fat, you also see less lipid spillover into organs such as the uh, liver, and you see less inflammation. So this puts hyperinsulinemia upstream of the inflammation as well. So we see less markers of stress and ER stress and this is in um, white adipose tissue and in other, other, um, uh, other tissues. <clears throat> so the conclusion from this uh, first part of the talk is that hyperinsulinemia is required for diet-induced obesity in this model, for inflammation, and for um, the lipid spillover. <clears throat> and this means that rather than simply being a consequence of insulin resistance and obesity, uh, here we can um, promote it up to being causal. And I think that there are, judging from the human data, there are cohorts of humans and, and ages and, and groups uh, that would uh, that their pathway to diabetes would go through this um, as well. And this means that theoretically, if we catch it early enough, and I, I was talking about flattening the curves before COVID-19, but now it sounds um, uh, now it sounds even cooler. Uh, but yeah, theoretically, you could actually uh, do disease modification and end up with a situation uh, where there's never any hyperglycemia. So the next uh, sort of third of the talk, I'm going to focus in on some work on insulin sensitivity. And this will include some data that is uh, brand new. I saw it for the first time on last Wednesday. Um, so what happens uh, if we reduce insulin production to insulin sensitivity? In a lot of uh, hormone situations, we think of, of receptor desensitization a lot. 
it's only in type two diabetes where we really don't think about that concept very often. And the idea that the resistance happens before the, the uh, high levels of the hormone, uh, as I said, it's kind of unique to type two diabetes. Most, most other endocrinology systems and neurotransmitter systems, we tend to think of it the other direction. So this is uh, Nicole's really large cohort of mice. Um, this, uh, I'll spoil a little bit of the secret here, but <clears throat> the reason these mice, uh, the cohorts were so large is this was part of our, our longevity study that we did. It's also the reason you don't see things like uh, uh, clamps because those are terminal experiments. Um, but if you take these mice, now, now insulin one is gone and they have two alleles or one allele of insulin two. Uh, insulin two is actually the one that's conserved in humans uh, for, for what it's worth. <clears throat> and these are the females. Um, you can see that the re reduction of fasting insulin is persistent. It's quite a minor effect, actually. There's not a huge difference in, in fasting insulin. And the very first, um, hopefully everyone can see my cursor, but the very first effect you see makes a lot of sense. Mice with less insulin have slightly higher glucose. We wouldn't have seen this if the ends weren't 20 or 30 mice per group here. But this, this fits. So a slight reduction in, in circulating insulin leads to, um, leads to slight hyperglycemia. But through most of their lives, and, th and this is the two diets um, diverging here. Uh, this pink one here is uh, slightly higher in fat. So it's 60%, 58%. They're not matched diets, so don't compare them directly. And this one here is the breeder chow. So it's got about 20% fat. It's not a low fat diet at all. But what you can see is that uh, fasting glucose is basically perfectly normal in these mice. They have that little bit more insulin on board. So they never had the hyperglycemia in their teenage years like that other uh, model did. But if you wait long enough, eventually out at 80, 90 weeks, you will start to see mice with less insulin have lower fasting glucose. And the reason is that these mice are, have improved insulin sensitivity. And this means that part of the reason uh, for the age-induced insulin resistance is the hyperinsulinemia itself. And this fits with the idea that insulin can downregulate its own receptors. So how does it do this? Um, a, a, a more recent, actually current, senior graduate student in the lab, Howard Sen, uh, uh, took this on as his project. He's been interested in understanding in non-islet cells, uh, and he focused his attention on muscle. How does hyperinsulinemia affect uh, the insulin receptor? And actually, these are not, um, these are the types of experiments that were done 20 or 30 years ago as well. Um, and hopefully, we're, we're adding a, at least a little bit um, We've rediscovered them and we've added uh, some uh, unbiased mechanistic analysis. But essentially, this is also not a new concept. So the way this experiment works, is we've, we've differentiated uh, these um, skeletal uh, muscle cells in culture. Um, these are a cell line. And then we give them zero, low, or what is actually extremely high uh, insulin levels. Uh, we can take some measurements here. We can also starve them for six hours and then do acute insulin stimulation. And I won't show you all the data. Uh, this has been uh, uploaded to BioArchive in a very early version of this, but we'll be doing a newer version soon. Um, uh, but this is an insulin resistance model. They do get resistance uh, to the AKT pathway primarily. Um, but what's really remarkable is the insulin protein levels. Uh, and we also know it's the insulin protein on the surface from biotinylation studies uh, is dramatically uh, reduced. Um, before starvation and after starvation. And even if we look in vivo, uh, in, in some of the mice, like I showed you before, that have variations in their insulin, uh, circulating insulin levels, you see this negative correlation with insulin receptor protein on skeletal muscle. Um, the mechanism for this, or a, a substantial part of the mechanism for this, appears to be downregulation at the mRNA level. Here you can see that the uh, A and B uh, splice isoforms are reduced. Um, they're, the mechanism for that, which had already been shown by, by some others and other cell types, uh, is, is at least partially due to the phosphorylation of FOXO1. 
at uh, T24. Uh, that's an association, uh, but we think that that's uh, important. Uh, but what we wanted to do is find some uh, additional novel regulators of hyperinsulinemia induced insulin receptor downregulation. And so um, Howard did an RNA seq experiment uh, with a with a decent uh, number of replicates. We've got five replicates per group here, and um, we have before serum and after serum, and you can see that the um, uh, the uh, cells that are treated with the hyperinsulinemia are well separated, and they um, uh, they are separated from each other as well. Uh, reassuringly, the pathways that are altered in these um, in these uh, treated cells are what you would hope for. FOXO signaling, insulin signaling, MAP kinase signaling, PI3 kinase signaling. Uh, these are all uh, the, the pathways in here. And the individual genes, uh, you can scan through uh, the interesting ones here, but there's um, uh, quite a few really interesting genes in here. And um, we also used a tool, uh, Howard used a tool uh, on networkanalyst.ca, good old Canadian website. And this tool takes your RNA-seq data set and predicts which transcription factors are, um, are upstream of it. So it helps, it helps, we were trying to understand the signaling between insulin signaling and all of these changed uh, genes. And so uh, we got a list of, of predicted uh, transcription factors. These are these squares, the big ones around the, uh, the circle. And then we cross-referenced it to things that were uh, significantly changed in our own data set, and that gave us 11. And then we did RNAi um, knockdown in all 11, and uh, we saw some regulators of IRS2. Uh, several of them were regulators of IRS2, but I'll just focus today on SYN3A, which we showed as a negative regulator of insulin receptor. And so that leads us to this model here, where probably both through FOXO after the prolonged hyperinsulinemia and through SYN3A uh, and probably quite a few other uh, factors will downregulate the insulin receptor and thereby um, reduce the amount of insulin uh, receptors on the membrane and reduce insulin signaling. So that's a mechanistic um, uh, explanation for the insulin resistance. Uh, so does this have any bearing to what is found in people? So. When COVID struck, I suggested to quite a few of the students that they um, learn some bioinformatics. And, uh, you know, it's really a wonderful time in science because so many people have done so many very powerful omics experiments and just put the data um, onto the internet. So we uh, were hunting through human skeletal muscle biopsy RNA seq data sets. Um, to look uh, both at the insulin receptor and other um, genes that are in that uh, similar uh, network. And, and just to, to look to see what correlates with uh, circulating insulin levels. And the two studies that we focused on so far, this is a somewhat smaller study, but very well matched, very well phenotyped um, people from, uh, from Denmark, uh, from the Jensen group. And uh, these have uh, controls, so normal uh, glucose, as well as a, a drug treated, they called them insulin resistant. Uh, so these people are on insulin. So some of the variation of insulin levels is exogenous and some is endogenous here. And these are on oral anti-diabetics um, and, and a variety of those. But when you look at them all together, or even when you look at them uh, individually, you can see a really nice negative correlation between insulin and the insulin receptor mRNA. Uh, and actually quite a few things, including the IGF-1 receptor. Uh, and then there are some negative regulators of this pathway, these um, uh, genes over here, which go the opposite direction. We also got a hold of a data set, which is the Finland, UK, uh, United States, rather, uh, fusion data set. And um, we, uh, it took us actually quite a bit of time to get all the data security stuff uh, set up. And uh, Howard uh, had to kick people out of the office because he's only allowed to use one computer for this. But you see, again, this now this has hundreds of people. 
but you, you see again a, um, a correlation uh, between insulin receptor gene expression and insulin. Also IGF-1 receptor, also IRS-2. Interestingly, this is a stronger correlation in males than females in this uh, larger data set. So the conclusion from this uh, second uh, chunk of the talk is that hyperinsulinemia is sufficient to cause insulin resistance in part through insulin receptor gene downregulation, which may inc uh, include FOXO1 and SYN3A as molecular mechanisms. <clears throat> so um, I know there's uh, a lot of uh, expertise in uh, lifespan analysis in Wisconsin, so I wanted to uh, talk about this and about uh, cancer, which is also obviously a major determinant of lifespan, both in humans and rodents. Um, but it struck me that, that these mice presented a unique opportunity to look at the insulin ligand and its effect on longevity. So if you're familiar with the, the worm and fly literature, you already know how this story know, uh, goes. Again, um, my ideas are not new. Uh, it's been known for a couple decades now that decreasing uh, insulin signaling or, it, or the insulin-like peptides in, in these invertebrate model systems can double uh, lifespan. And uh, there's some evidence pointing a bit towards that in mammals, but uh, no one had looked at insulin specifically, and a lot of folks had focused on IGF-1. Insulin is the ligand that we have the most control over. It's acutely regulated by diet at a minute-to-minute -minute level. And, uh, and, a, and by fasting and, and other uh, features like this. So I wanted to, to look at insulin itself. So let's look at some of the um, circumstantial evidence around the insulin signaling pathway that gave us uh, some confidence here to look into it. Um, there is evidence that uh, IGF-1 receptor uh, can, uh, can extend lifespan in, in heterozygous form shown here. Um, all these studies are very difficult and they require a lot of money and a lot of mice. And, um, you know, sometimes you get different answers in different uh, facilities. But generally, I'm trying to suggest there's some sort of some smoke around the area. Um, there is also evidence in uh, uh, IRS-1. Um, this is a, the replication paper, Withers and, and, and Partridge. Again, uh, some sex uh, specific differences and a slightly different effect on IRS2. Um, what's important here is that insulin and IGF1 could use the IRSs. So it's not diagnostic for which uh, is the ligand of relevance. We also know that um, uh, uh, caloric restriction or dietary restriction is associated uh, with longevity. It, this is um, seen in, in, in many, many uh, models. I learned from uh, Dudley today that there's even more nuances to this than, than I had appreciated, which is fantastic. <clears throat> and then inhibitors of the joint insulin IGF signaling pathway, obviously <clears throat> rapamycin as an example. Um, here you can see it given late in life. Here there's a bit of a difference already and here um, you can see some extension after the, uh, uh, the uh, treatment. But what about insulin itself? So we go back to these mice, reminder that this is actually a pretty small manipulation. They have only, you know, 25% reduction in, uh, in, in insulin. And for my money, it's one of the smallest uh, manipulations where folks have tried to look at, at lifespan. Uh, we, at both the time points we looked, we could not see any difference in IGF-1 levels or in any of the other hormones uh, or peptides we looked at. A uh, reminder that these mice, even when they're older, are slightly leaner. <clears throat> and you can see this in body mass and fat mass and protected from hepatic steatosis. Um, <clears throat> these are two-year-old mice, roughly. And here's the uh, take-home message from here is that mice with reduced insulin gene dosage, these are shown in the lighter colors, have an increased um, uh, median lifespan. And if you take the maximal lifespan of the uh, top quintile, it's also an increase in maximal lifespan. Every single mouse in this study went to a uh, pathologist and it was blinded. Uh, the pathologist wasn't blind, but you know they didn't know which mice were which. And they were trying to um, uh, assign a cause of death. And this is obviously difficult because 
their mice and uh, getting at cause of death uh, retrospectively is, is not it's not that easy, but they did their best. And we, we really couldn't find one specific thing that the mice were being protected from. Um, there were hints, there was, you know, a little bit of um, protection, general protection uh, from what was identified as renal degeneration. It took a long time for the first mouse on this higher fat diet to get their first malignant cancer. That was interesting to us. Um, but generally, the mice were kind of protected across the board by having less insulin. So the bottom line here is that uh, modestly reduced um, insulin can improve health and extend lifespan in mice. So that cancer result and a few other ones, which I didn't have a chance uh, to show you, um, got us thinking about how do you test this directly? Obviously, we were underpowered to study any particular cancer because the mice have a variety of types of cancers. And the controversy and the interest was growing over what's called the insulin cancer hypothesis. So it's well established that obesity and the early stages of type 2 diabetes are linked to multiple um, cancer cell types. But it's not really clear whether it's uh, the hyperglycemia, uh, the inflammation that is associated with both of these, the hyperinsulinemia, the hyperlipidemia, some, it could be any of these factors. Um, but we do know that hyperinsulinemia is an independent risk factor, uh, even as shown down here in non-obese uh, participants. Uh, so there was a whole bunch of human um, epidemiological sort of circumstantial evidence uh, su suggesting a link, and this is across quite a few cancers. The link was particularly strong with pancreas cancer, but um, it's also uh, the, obviously the site of the insulin production. And there is a, a sort of a dual causality with pancreas cancer because both pancreas cancer and its treatments can cause diabetes as well. So pulling apart the, the causality uh, there is a little bit tricky. So this is again where we turned to our animal model. Um, these are now mice again with two alleles or one allele of the insulin one gene crossed on to um, a mouse model of uh, the early stages of pancreatic cancer. So this is the pancreatic acinar specific uh, CRE, PTF1A, uh, driving the uh, K12D uh, mutant KRAS. And this is exactly the same mutation that's responsible for 90% of human uh, pancreatic cancer. So it's really a um, uh, relevant model. And this model was really uh, spearheaded by uh, Janelle Kopp, who we were fortunate enough to recruit um, to our uh, department a few years ago. And she's been absolutely um, uh, instrumental in, uh, in these studies and teaching uh, our joint student Annie Zhang, uh, how to do all the pathology. <clears throat> so as you can see here, the mice, again, have a pretty small difference in um, uh, circulating insulin, it's about, half, well, it's about half as much, but you can see a lot of variation. Everyone knows there's a lot of variation in, in insulin levels. Uh, so much variation here in, 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 at one year, it's not actually significantly different. But what we know is for sure not different, either significantly or numerically, <clears throat> is the hyperglycemia. So the Female mice here, there's absolutely no difference in, um, in glucose uh, homeostasis. And the mice, again, I'm not a pathologist. And for those of us not used to doing cancer uh, research, when, we, when I first saw these uh, pancreas sections, I was like, what? It was the grossest thing I'd ever seen. But yeah, there's basically very little acinar left. And this, this pancreas is all filled with these um, uh, precancerous lesions called panions. And panins come in uh, grades one, two, uh, three, and, and, and on. <clears throat> and so uh, reducing insulin reduced the number of panins, reduced their grade. It reduced the, um, uh, the inflammation shown here. It uh, reduced the um, uh, uh, mucin um, uh, levels as well. And this is quantified here in pancreas uh, panin plus tumor area over total pancreas area. Again, mice with about 50% less insulin have about 50% less of the of the any of pancreatic cancer. 
Uh, we're setting up to do this in xenografts and in models that have more advanced metastatic pancreatic cancer when you add in a, a P53 uh, point mutant, for example. Um, but the conclusion of this section here uh, is that modestly reduced insulin uh, can significantly lower the incidence of these uh, pancreatic cancer pre precursor lesions. So I just want to spend uh, some of the rest of my time, and I want to leave lots of time open for questions, to talk about um, some of our unpublished data looking at the mechanisms. So one of the things, and we're, we will have the data soon, is uh, we don't really know whether this is a direct effect on the tumor cells or not. We think that that's part of it, um, but we're also doing the um, insulin receptor knockout in the tumor cell uh, population. And um, those mice are being analyzed, or the sections from those mice are being analyzed as we speak. But one of the things we wanted to do in our model was try to take a stab at which cell types and which mechanisms might be changed in the controlled uh, hyperinsulinemic condition versus the mice with reduced insulin levels. And the first step, of course, just to simply ask what cell types have insulin receptors that are relevant? And the answer is, is basically all of them. So this is um, from Annie's uh, single cell RNA-seq data set. This is um, uh, from the KRAS mouse. But you see the same thing if you, roughly the same thing if you look in the human immune and the human pancreas data sets and you look for the insulin receptor um, mRNA levels, uh, you know, it's quite abundant on fibroblasts, a variety of uh, T and B cells, macrophages, um, you know, uh, acinar cells themselves, ductal cells. Uh, many cells will have insulin receptors. And I also remind you that insulin uh, receptors, as with all membrane proteins, you, don't, you actually don't need a lot of mRNA uh, to have, um, to have uh, protein levels. And that made me, uh, you know, I drew this for a review that I'm supposed to have submitted already. Um, but yeah, you can just imagine that the hyperinsulinemia coming from the islet cells could really act on a, the precursor to the cancer cells, here the acinar cells, the ductal cells, the blood vessels, neurons, any of these immune cells, fibroblasts, they all local adipocytes, they're all potentially insulin target tissues. <clears throat> so uh, Annie uh, did a single cell RNA sequencing experiment. Uh, word of caution, uh, you know, I think those of you who've already tried this know this, uh, but it is, uh, <laughs> the pancreas might be the worst uh, tissue to do single cell RNA-seq uh, because, of course, it produces enormous amount of RNAs and, um, and getting out intact cells um, is, is tricky. Uh, so we did our best. We sorted for live cells in, in all cases. Uh, so we fact sorted them after isolating them. And um, so what we think here is that the gene expression is primarily uh, uh, from our, our live cells. And we also did some post hoc because exploding a post hoc sort of um, uh, gene garbage cleanup, if you will, because exploding cells, even if you only take uh, pure happy cells, they're, the surrounding media contains RNA from cells that didn't make it. So there are some programs now where you can look, for example, if there is um, uh, one of the highly abundant um, Asner uh, gene mRNAs, and you start to see a little bit of it in every single cell, you can informatically uh, clean that up. But either way, we have uh, well demarked uh, cell types here. Um, if anything, the, um, uh, the reduced insulin gene dosage made the cells uh, maybe a little bit less, um, uh, or sorry, the hyperinsulinemia rather made the cells a little bit less mature in that they're, the markers that they're famous for were, were less abundant. Um, we also see this interesting group of cells that are proliferating cells. They sort of clustered uh, amongst themselves. And this is a group of proliferating cells, which I don't have time to describe today, but actually contains multiple cell types in here. We, we're analyzing those ones as well. But I'll just, zip through some of this data because I think it's kind of interesting. This is the type of data you get. You get obviously RNA-seq data. It's not that deep, 
So you're looking again, mostly at the top sort of third expressed genes, but you get some interesting insights. You see, um, uh, in, you know, you can then take your individual genes and run them into the reactome uh, pathway uh, generator, and you can get um, uh, significant pathways. If you look across all the different cell types, and I promise you, I will blow this up in pieces so you won't have to uh, try to read it. But what you can see here is that uh, for some of the pathways, so these are the cells across the bottom, and these are the, the reactome pathways uh, vertically here. Some pathways were changed in lots of lots of cell types. So down here in this blue group, you've got pathways that were changed in a lot of cell types. And then you have uh, up here at the top, the opposite, uh, pathways that were only really dramatically changed in one or two different cell types. So I'll try to walk through from the bottom up uh, some examples here. So uh, translation and mRNA processing were changed in a lot of different cell types, um, more so in these proliferating cell populations than in some of the other ones. Um, but you can see here the, the uh, reactome terms that, that were changed. Signaling uh, was, was changed. Uh, this, uh, you know, these are a lot of um, uh, a cluster, actually, of different pathways, trying to make it a little bit more simple. But here you can see MAP kinase and, and a variety of other signaling pathways. You know, as you would expect from um, uh, regulation of insulin and hyperinsulinemia. Uh, this is just a grab bag of others. Um, uh, protein metabolism. So here we have uh, sumulation, nedulation, uh, um, deubiquination, et cetera, et cetera. You can see there's some cell types you have changes in, but not others. Um, general. Uh, uh, Substrate metabolism here as well. You can see differences. These, this proliferating cell group, which also incidentally had the most pathways uh, di significantly different, um, seems to have an alteration in, uh, in its metabolism, a little bit here in the B cells and the dendritic cells as well. Um, there is obviously we have a lot of immune cells here, so a lot of immune pathways uh, came up. Matrix. A reorganization seemed to be relatively specific to fibroblasts. Uh, DNA repair, relatively specific to the proliferating cell uh, group. Uh, cellular resp uh, response to stress, senescence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Hypoxia was lightly seen sort of across the board. <clears throat> cell cycle as expected in these proliferating cells, but also in, in B cells and, 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 not, and also in the acinar cells. We saw a signal for more proliferation using uh, KI-67 in our, in our paper, but it wasn't significant. It was just a little bit under in all the different cell types. Um, so the conclusion from this section here is that modestly reduced insulin uh, can significantly and differentially affect uh, cell type specific gene expression. So my overall conclusions here, I'll just leave them up. And um, uh, you know, is that we, right now we don't have a way of modifying the course of type 2 diabetes. I didn't uh, have a chance to show you, but we and others are looking carefully at uh, how uh, different diets, including uh, low carbohydrate diets, and that's what the IPTN is working on. We have a, a really nice paper just about to come out, um, uh, building on papers from others, but this is a randomized clinical trial, um, which uh, shows you, know, you can get people off of their medications, essentially reverse or remit their type 2 diabetes. Um, so, you know, I would never say, you know, insulin is good or bad. Obviously, if you don't have enough insulin, um, you'll have diabetes, but there's certainly evidence here that a lot of us are potentially carrying around more than we need. And I hope I've provided some evidence for how this could uh, uh, cause insulin resistance and obesity and, and talk a little bit about the effects on cancer. <clears throat> I want to spend a few moments to thank uh, the really wonderful people who, who did this work. Um, most of what I showed today is the work of Nicole. She is now a Canada Research Chair at uh, University of Victoria. She just started her lab <clears throat> um, a month or so ago. Fantastic student. I showed uh, Aria's work, Diego's work, Annie's work, Howard's work, a lot of wonderful collaborators and funding agencies. 
And I really want to take a moment to dedicate this lecture um, to the late uh, Susie Klee, whose office is uh, two doors down from mine. Um, and uh, unfortunately, she passed this summer suddenly, but uh, her expertise in, in genetics, um, much of which she uh, gained in Wisconsin uh, with uh, Professor Addy, uh, was really invaluable for, for all of our studies and she made a major contribution. I would like everyone to know that um, we'll be hosting a, um, a symposium in her honor uh, in mid late November and keep an eye on my uh, Twitter feed or email me if you want to know exactly when that is. It might be the 18th um, of November. Anyway, uh, with that, I will uh, take any questions. Thank you, Jim. This was fascinating and great talk. And I'm sure there will be many questions. And the way that we will handle this questions is that you can either write your name to the chat or you can raise your hand and I will let you talk. Uh, while we're waiting for the questions, Jim, is there a correlation between, uh, or has anyone shown indeed, uh, hyperinsulinemia and EMT, epithelium mesenchymal transition? Oh my goodness. Uh, there's a correlation with hyperinsulinemia and a lot of things, but that um, EMT is an area I don't know very much about, so I, I hesitate to, to answer, but uh, where there is hyperplasia and where there is cancer, there is the correlation with hyperinsulinemia. Um, so I, I, I really wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, we're with collaborations, you know, there's the major um, correlation with uh, PCOS as well and, and hypertension. And we're always, we, we send the mice to lots of different people uh, and collaborate. So uh, they're really a powerful tool to get at the specific effects of, of insulin per se. But I don't know the EMT uh, question, sorry. Sure. Uh, we have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Jason is going first. Jason, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Oh yeah, hi Jim, great uh, talk. Um, I had a question with regards to the uh, mice. Um, you showed the data that high fat diet really increases the insulin, which is a little bit different than humans because mm -hmm. dietary fat really has no effect on um, insulin production really. Uh, what's, what's the difference in mice? Because I see a lot of these conclusions where people talk about high fat diets therefore being bad, but it's like, but in rats, mm -hmm. it causes that's a great question. And in, lo in a longer format of my talk, I really uh, dig into that. So that's a really astute uh, point. So um, in adult humans, the vast, and we actually have a large series data set that, that we're also soon to publish, where we've done isolated uh, islets, uh, dynamic analysis of insulin secretion by perifusion on now 120 different uh, preps of, of human islets. So we're kind of taking a survey. And it is correct that the majority of humans have little to no response um, to free fatty acids as adults. Now, actually, the, there's probably some response um, pre-weaning because the majority of, uh, you know, uh, breast milk is, has a lot of lipids in it. So very young human islets may actually be a little bit more like mice. And when it comes to, to mice, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take, yeah, I don't like taking the diet one-to-one. -to -one. I think what makes a mouse hyperinsulinemic and what makes a human hyperinsulinemic are actually different as, as, as you would expect them to be. The, the diets, the natural diets of a mouse and a human are actually uh, quite different. Um, but, but I believe that the, the consequences of that hyperinsulinemia um, are conserved uh, throughout mammals and then, as I said, all the way uh, down to, to flies and, and worms. So um, if you, interestingly, if you go really, 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 really high, so if you go to a diet, a mouse ketogenic diet, which is basically giving the mice just essentially lard, um, you, can't, uh, you can suppress insulin secretion. So it's just that that shape of that bell curve is way, uh, way further in a mouse. So um, it, it also depends which fat 
Um, but yeah, so the, you're you're 100 correct that the um, uh, the way that you can induce hyperinsulinemia is different in mice, adult mice, and adult humans. Um, but the probably the consequences of that hyperinsulinemia are, I think, conserved pretty well across species. Okay, next question is from Heiko Lickers is joining from Germany. I can allow him to talk. If there is a technical glitch, I will uh, read his uh, question from the chat. If you can unmute yourself, you can- Hi, add. Heiko. Hey, Jim, can you hear me? I can, you sound fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw it on Twitter, obviously, that you gave give a talk here in Wisconsin, joined in uh, 10.30 now, night time, but was really fun to listen to you. Um, Jim, I was wondering, the insulin resistance, I think is uh, super interesting upon the hyperinsulinemia and Howard's data looked interesting in the muscle cells. And so, you know, it, it, it was really fast that the insulin receptor, also IGF-1 receptor, got downregulated like six hours. But then in vivo, in your, in your, in your models, it seems like the hyperinsulinemia or blunting blunting the hyperinsulinemia take much longer to have an effect on insulin receptors. Is that true? It is true in that model. We have another one, which I didn't have time to show, which we haven't published yet. But um, if you give the mice a high sucrose diet, which also causes massive hyperinsulinemia, um, we can see the, the separation in the, so you give the mice with normal insulin uh, gene dosage, the sucrose on top of the diet I just showed you, you see the hyperinsulinemia, you can prevent that very quickly again. But the insulin resistance that we see, we see it very fast and we see the prevention very fast. So in the sucrose model, um, which I apologize, I, if I had five hours, I would get to it. But in the sucrose model, we see it in weeks instead of almost two years. So I, I think there was something specific about those other diets that somehow um, masked it. Uh, you know, they, they're probably getting insulin resistant for other reasons. The, the high fat used in that other diet um, is a kind of an old school diet. I think it's a large, so maybe they were getting some insulin resistance that is hyperinsulinemia independent. I'm sure they were as well. So that's, that's a great question. Thank, thanks, Jim. I mean, I'm asking because of our obviously negative regulator of the insulin receptor, and yeah. we wanted to know how quick, how quick, really, the insulin resistance, you know, appears after. I'll send you. A, I'll send you that data set. If you send me an email, I'll just, I'll just put it on. Slack. I will. Thanks, Jim. It was great. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Um, Andrea is the next one. Andrea. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, it was a great talk. I'm curious about, to know what your opinion about uh, neutralizing antibodies to correct hyperinsulinemia. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I didn't get a lot of traction um, when I worked for the world's largest maker of insulin for approaching, um, approaching uh, as a therapeutic angle uh, the idea of inhibiting insulin. Um, but, the, you know, the biological rationale for this is as good as many other things. You just have to get it at the right stage. Now, uh, I mean, as an experiment, I think I think it's cool. As a, as a drug candidate, it, it actually sounds a little bit more expensive um, for something that you could do with diet and exercise. So this is another thing I mentioned diet, but uh, exercise cessation is actually a, also a really robust stimulator of hyperinsulinemia as well. So, um, you know, exercise and, and diet are things that are uh, potentially require less infusions, but, but theoretically it should work. And actually it's the sort of thing that I, I would love to see someone try in a, in a clinical model. Obviously, there are there are insulin receptor inhibitor drugs, but it but those cause hyperinsulinemia as well. So both the the all the ERCO knockouts, including the insulin receptor knockout on the beta cell, as as we just uh, published last Friday, 
Um, but uh, they, a lot of these things will cause a hyperinsulinemia. And, and so then it's hard to tease apart insulin resistance from the hyperinsulinemia. But your idea uh, of the neutralizing antibody, I think that's something that should be at least tried. You'd have to do it in the right first preclinical model. And then uh, you, clinically, you need to pick the right population. And we know from the geneticists that there's maybe five or six different kinds of type two diabetes. There's probably the same number of, you know, genetically different obesities at least. Uh, so eventually we would like to get to personalizing these things where you, you can figure out which people are on, are on a track that was initiated by hyperinsulinemia, which people were on a track that was initiated by something else. You wouldn't want to give the neutralizing antibodies at the wrong stage of the, of the progression of type 2 diabetes or could then be counter, counterproductive. Okay. Sure. I, I mean, I would, if I had to pick, I would probably test it first in the cancer model. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there are people doing, um, well, we are setting up to do a, a clinical trial uh, in pancreas cancer is tough because, you know, they, 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 about half the people get diabetes from the treatment and some of the cancer. Uh, but it's not even known whether you can control glucose homeostasis in, in those people. And so our first trial, um, uh, sort of a phase one, two, will just to see, see if that can be possible. Uh, but yeah, it, cancer would be a, a place to think about that. You still have the IGF. Um, and the same thing, the insulin receptor blocker drugs have been tried, um, but then insulin the ligand can still act through um, IGF-1 receptors at, including at physiologically relevant uh, doses. It's a smaller effect, but it goes through a, uh, goes through some of the same signaling pathway. Okay. Next Thank question you. is from Matt Flowers. Hi. Matt, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Hey, Jim, that was a great talk. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, from an acute insulin secretion standpoint, have any of the gene dosage um, manipulation models ever shown insulin secretion to be limiting enough to impair the time to return to uh, euglycemia, especially after a... Um, a uh, very large stimulus, like a mixed meal tolerance test or uh, oral glucose tolerance test? That's a great question. So uh, I can and, and try to address it two ways. One is it really depends on what insulin you, you have left over. So we actually know now that if you have one allele of the minor insulin, insulin one, especially again in our new SPF facility, a lot of these mice can't make it. So that's just it's only in males, but there's, it's just not enough. So clearly, clearly that is that is an issue. What is surprising though is is in the other models, including when you have one allele of INCE2 left, or the females of um, the one allele of INCE1 left, which females, as we all know, are, are tougher and more robust anyway. Um, what what is interesting is that most of the effect we see is on fasting insulin. In, in many of them, and, and they still they still have a response to glucose. I mean, there's maybe a little bit less. We did an inducible model that was Page et al. and FASEV, and the first phase, the peak was exactly the same, and you could see a difference in the second phase by perifusion, but uh, the, there's not a gene dose limitation on that first acute response to a square wave glucose, um, but it's the sustained response and it's the basal um, that we think are, are more gene dosage correlated with. But that's a great question. Great, thank you. Okay, um, are there any other questions? I see some hands are raised, but the, the, those already asked questions. Just Extra looking questions. into the chat now. Is there good questions in the chat? Uh, there is one, but you already answered that one. Great. And <clears throat> uh, there is uh, much talk now about inhibition of glucagon from EVE to all participants. If you want to comment on that. 
uh, glucagon in in which in which participants? Um, uh, sorry, in, in inhibition of glucagon in type one diabetes. Uh, I am not sure, but maybe because that's that. What you if you want to type two diabetes? Yeah, type uh, two. you know what I I. I think that we are, we are, we have been remiss. We've been a bit insulin uh, centric. Uh, we understand that there, um, there are other hormones. We just tend not to talk about them very much. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, clearly though, insulin is the only non-redundant meal regulated metabolic hormone that I'm aware of. So it's like, there's insulin on one side, and then there's glucagon and a few other things stacked up on the other side. Are there defects in glucagon and um, in, in alpha cells in actually probably maybe both types of diabetes? Probably. Um, I and therefore I think you know an ideal therapeutic would address them. I don't think they're like the root cause of the disease, though. I don't think that. Um, you know, the alpha cells are still primarily spared, uh, at least in type one. Uh, but yeah, it's a bit of a hand wavy answer, but I think that if we, uh, if you were to ideally replace the function of beta cells, say with a transplant, you would wanna, uh, you would wanna have beta cells, alpha cells, delta cells, um, you know, vasculature, neurons, surrounding cells, you know, biology, the eyelid has evolved as a, as a microorgan. And, um, you know, I, I still believe insulin is, is, is really primary, but everything else is fine tuning. And to me, type two diabetes is a disease of the loss of fine tuning. You know, it's not, um, you know, it's not a catastrophic, you know, loss of the whole pancreas. It's, it, it starts off probably as, as fine tuning gone wrong. Uh, so adaptation, and again, in another longer version of this talk, I would talk about how hyperinsulinemia initially uh, probably promotes an increase in, in beta cell mass in response to, you know, to adapt and to, um, uh, to give you that um, ad adaptability in, in, in youth and in, as an adolescent. However, as an adult, if you're stuck with a certain floor, a certain minimum number of beta cells, which always leak out a minimum amount of insulin, that's your hyperinsulinemia floor. So if you're, if you are, um, what might have been adapt adaptive early in life may end up becoming um, maladaptive uh, later in life. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, I think if there are no other questions from non-trainee uh, attendees, then we will thank you again, Jim. This was a great talk. I'm gonna be applauding on behalf of the other <laughs> attendees. Thanks. And then we can leave, but you stay here with the trainees. I see Chris Semra raising their hands. So I think you will get a great session with our trainees. Okay. Thank you. And, you, and you've recorded this, so um, we can put it up in a Dropbox and people can look at it. Yes, well. yes. It's, Thanks it's, for doing that, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, bye to everyone except the trainees who I will talk with now. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.